let me just put here start. Oh yeah, we need I to do this item. Oops, start. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, because I forgot all that I just typed there. Okay, thank you. So let's jump into chapter twelve. It's Did other you start the recording if, already. Uh yeah, the recording starts automatically. Oh, got it. Okay, sorry about that. But yeah, but the start and end help because that's when um they uh automatically I think makes the cut so that whatever we discussed before is not in the recording. Same thing with end. And if I Sorry type to... start now, which is what I'm gonna do, then it takes the second start. It doesn't go with the first one. So let me do the second start now again. Now it starts. All right, so let's discuss this chapter. Before I do that, let's just take a quick look at the climate chapter, uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, share this one. Okay, so this is the document that we have with all the chapters that we have gotten so far and who is assigned to do them. So thank you guys for understanding that I couldn't be here last week, but now we are definitely going to go through chapter 12. Next week, we have Kaya, who's going to walk us through chapter 13, which is how to build a plot layer by layer so that things are starting to become more complicated and, uh, and how to add more things to this, uh, to this plot. The following weeks, we don't have anything. So scales and guides, coordinate systems. So we need to figure out who can do this. This date... I can't do any of these two chapters because I have to prepare for a conference. My talk is exactly this day on October 23rd. So I can't do any of these two. So if anybody can, please just sign up for these two chapters. And then we need faceting too, but that's in November. And then we have a few others um, for November already lined up. So we are... Um, more than halfway through the book, so that's great. So that now we can focus on uh, on our chapter. So now that I have, let me see what I'm screen sharing. Yes, you're looking at my chapter here, okay. So let's go through chapter 12. Like I said, we're gonna discuss other aesthetics that we haven't discussed before, including uh, how to do um, or how to scale the sizing of any objects that we have or any of the geoms that we have on a graph, how to scale um, the shapes, which are going to be like if we have a circle, if we have a square, if we have a cross in one of the geoms. Also how to scale different line types. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like a, uh, like a solid line. It could be a dashed line. It could be a point line or dotted line. And then how to work with manual scales, which is the one that I use the most. So if we want to set, um, if we want to like sort of um, override the scales, whichever it is, color, size, shape, line, if we want to override that and we want to um, set the values for that scale, that's, for, um, that's what manual scales are for. And then the identity scales. It's a very short chapter. So let's, let's go through it. So first, let's discuss about size. So the size aesthetic is typically going to be used with points and text. And essentially what we're doing is we're scaling the size of the points or the geoms that are on the graph. So usually what we do is when we're plotting, um, let's say in this case, the empty cars values here, we have um, two variables. So we have the, this BS, BISBL, I don't remember what that is. Uh, but we have two variables here in the X and Y axis. And then we add a third one, which is gonna be how many cylinders each car has. So this third one, we put it in the argument size on what it's gonna do. It is going to change the radius of each one of these circles in order to sort of like show the difference in the number of cylinders that each one has. Displacement, ah, displacement, sorry, which is the size of the engine, okay. 
I know a little bit about cars. I know them names in Spanish. So when I see these names in English, sometimes I'm like, I don't know what that means. Anyway, so the size of the engine. So this is what's showing us on X. On the X axis is going to be the size of the engine. And then the Y axis is going to be the gas, the number of miles? No. I don't remember what this HWY is. But anyway. I think it's, it's going to be another mileage. Bar. Yeah, it's mileage, right? Okay. So it's going to be the mileage. The important thing here is that we are selecting a third variable to showcase the difference here on the size of the dots. However, you don't necessarily want to do the radius in other cases because the radius is going to show variation right in the size of the circle in the sense of just that component, the radius. But no, sometimes it's better to showcase a linear increase in the area and you can set um, the scale of that increase or that linear um, scaling. So for that, we do this. We use the scale size function instead of, so you do the size equal cylinder, so you're selecting here exactly what the variable is going to do, and then you do G on point. But then you add the scale size and you put the range. So this range argument, what it's doing, and I put it here as an annotation, is going to control the minimum, so it's going to be one, and the maximum, which is going to be two, for the size of the point. So that's going to be your scale. This scale right here is going from one to two. So in this case, the smallest point is going to have a size of one, which is going to be four. Four is the, the smallest um, value that we have in, on, this, uh, on this variable. So that's going to be have an area of one. And then the largest one is going to have, which is eight, it's going to have a, an area of two. The other points are going to be scaled in between those two values. So this is going to be 1.2, 1.4, 1 1.6, 1 you know, 1.8, all the way up to 2. So that's what it automatically does. Um, you can set this to be 0 to 10, 1 to 100. You decide what that range is going to be, and that is essentially controlling. We're going to see a few examples, the difference here. So um, let me just do this here. OK, so there are different size scales. So that one is going to control scale size. It's going to control area. We also have um, one that actually in immediate I think we lost Gabby, didn't we? Yeah. OK. Maybe she'll come back in a minute. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, I, I don't know how deep we want to dig into it, but um, I understand displacement as like, it's the size of the cylinder. And so like the larger the cylinder, the more powerful the car is. I don't think we really need to know it, but I just- No, I was just curious. In. Yeah. Um, I also I've just used, cars. yeah, I've just used MPG so much that like, I've like looked at it so much that one time I was like, what is displacement? <laughs> like, but- I think she's coming back. There you go. Sorry you about that. Right? Can you, yeah, can you see me now? Yeah, we got you. Okay, sorry about that. Let me see. I think this is my screen. Let's check. Yeah. Oh, no, you have my other screen. Wait, wait, wait. Stop sharing. Share. I think it's this one. Share. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um. So here. Okay. So I, there are other size functions. The important one is that you can, so that you remember that you can have another one for specifically area. But that one, the scale size controls the area of the, in this case, of the circle. Um, but you also have a direct one that's going to have area. And another one for scale radius, 
radius, sorry. And then we're going to have scale size bind, which I'm going to explain in a little bit. But you also have scale size date and date time, specifically to handle date and time um, variables. So when we talk about radius, which is exactly what we were doing here at the beginning, but if you want to further customize the radius scale, then that's when you, we use this one, right? Scale radius. So let's say, for example, that we have um, the radius of all the planets in our solar system. So we're gonna have this graph right here when we are going to determine that the size uh, is gonna be the radius, which is this column right here, right? And then we're gonna say, so this is how it's gonna look like. We haven't included any scale so far. So this is just specifying that the radius of each planet, that's exactly what's controlling the size of the circles, but the size is not necessarily the area, right? The size is the radius too. So I just don't wanna confuse that a little bit. But if we see here, for example, the difference between Saturn and Jupiter, it's not that obvious. And between Earth and Jupiter, yes, it is. But it's, there's no much difference between Mars and Earth and Earth either, right? So I think we can tweak a little bit more the scale to show the differences between these planets or to better show the difference between these planets. So to do that, what we do is we use the scale radius. So the scale radius, radius is going to, we can set the limits. So the limit is going to be zero because the ra the smallest radius that we have is zero, so there's nothing there. And then we set it to NA to just allow ggplot to pick whichever largest number we have in our data set. So in this case, it's going to be 60,330. I think it's going to be miles, if I'm not mistaken. And then by setting the range, again, we are saying that the smallest one, which is going to be Mercury, if I'm not mistaken, so this one, it's going to use a scale of zero. So that's going to have like the smallest value possible. And then the largest one that we have is going to have a size 10 of radius. So then the, in that, by doing that, by setting this range, and you could, you could have 0 to 20, you could have 0 to 50. It's just the difference that you're setting. Yes, Kaya? Yeah, so I'm a little confused about this. I understand the range one, but I'm not sure I understand the limits one. Um, because, yeah. like, why would it not just take the maximum value already from the data? Why do you have to? Is it, is it because you want to explicitly specify 0, but there's no 0 in the data? Yeah, so let's go and see here. Um, so if we, let's see scale radius. If we see the uh, um, the description of this, so it's gonna be limits, yeah. So the limits, it's a function that accepts the existing limits and returns new limits, right? So for us, the smallest one was, which one, 2440? So that's what this thing is showing. But now we're sort of like saying, maybe let's do this. Maybe let's do it like, I don't know if this is going to accept yeah. it. I think this it. makes let's sense. Let's compare the two. Like by default, it would just I take the smallest and largest value from your data. But if you want to tell it to do something other than that, you have to specify limits. Yeah, so I think this example, what it's showing you is that you can set, you can set the limits because your smallest size is not zero. It's gonna be twenty four forty here. So you are setting that this zero is gonna correspond to this zero two, and then the maximum one that you have here, which is in this case, you put an A because you don't wanna put this value or you don't want to set it, you don't want to cap it. So by setting an A, this is going to pick this value, the largest one that you have, which is, oh no, sorry, it's Jupiter, 71,000. 
sorry, sorry. And that is going to be the 10. I think that's what this is doing. It's just matching the range with the limits. Um, so then that's what you'll, because if you see here, you start here with 20,000. This is not to scale, right? 20,000, 2,000, 20,000. Yeah. Is it not 10,000? Ah, this is the other thing that this is selecting as uh, like a legend that is not necessarily the legend that we want, because what it's saying is that anything 20,000 or less is going to look like this. Between 20,000 and 40,000 is going to look like this, and between 40,000 and 60,000, like it's going to be like in between these sizes. So that's the other thing that this thing is doing, if I'm not mistaken. So this little thing right here, which is not to scale, right? So this one, it, let's say, for example, this one is 20,000. Anything less than 20,000 is going to appear smaller. Gotcha. So this is okay. creating, yeah, so this is creating that legend for you. But here, I think that by setting the limits, we're specifying that this value is going to be zero because we can change it. Just let me see how I can, this planets one. Mm. Yeah, I don't have the planets. Let me see if I have it here. Uh, I'm realizing now that I've used the scale thing, but not for size. I think I used it for color because I had um, several different they weren't literally facets, but like several different similar plots that I was going to put together with patchwork. And I needed them all to yeah. have the same color scale, but not all of them had the same range of values, like for that year or for that, like whatever it was. So I was like, I need this color scales to match. I need to be able to compare apples to apples instead of just taking each one in relation to itself. And it was really yeah. useful, useful to be able to set the limits for that. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, I've used the manual scale too much more too. This is just another way of doing things in general, I think. I don't think these examples are necessarily the most efficient ones, but this is what the book is showing us. I think sometimes just to see how these functions work. I don't necessarily agree with the way they're showing it. It's the most efficient one. But anyway, so this is how the graph, that graph looks like. So now let's change the limits. So let's, let's, let's add this part right here. So if I do, first, and then let's set the limit to, let's say, 1,000, two, three. So yeah, so now this is saying that this, this is why it's, this is 20,000. So let's compare to the other one. Hey, it's exactly the same, why? The limits, let me see the limits here. Oh, oops. And now let's put zero, which is the way they have the example. Yeah, I think the limits, by specifying the zero, it's just putting that the smallest one is gonna be zero, so it adds it here. Because if I were to put it 100, yeah, this is just by setting this zero, this is how it starts. You see here, it starts with zero, so that it's going to be the smallest one matched to zero, which in this case is going to be, there's probably not much difference between these four ones. So I think that's exactly what, what that is doing. And then the range is going to be from zero to 10. Because if we don't specify that limit at zero, then it's going to say this. Anything below 20,000 is essentially going to be, yeah, marked as zero. But this is forcing it to be zero, I think. I think, I think that's how I understand this thing. So essentially, I put this example here too, just to showcase that this range is going to set the limits 
of how the smallest value is going to look like, which is zero. And then the largest one is going to have, in this case, a radius of 10, which is going to be Jupiter. That radius is 10. The smallest one, which is Mercury, has a, it's essentially just a point, right? The radius is practically zero. Everything in between is scaled for the scale of a value between zero and 10. So 0 0.5, point, so 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If you were to set the range to 100, again, you're just switching up the scale, which can be done, right? But then the range, the maximum is going to be like the largest object you have, which is Jupiter here. The radius is 100, and the smallest one, again, Mercury, is zero. Everything in between goes, like the medium one is going to be 50 have a radius of 50, right? So this is something that you can play with just so that obviously this is not good, right? So then that's how you start saying, oh, maybe a, a scale of 10 or maybe 20. And then that's how you sort of like start playing with it in order for you to say, yeah, this looks acceptable. Or maybe you don't want a zero here, you want a 10. So it doesn't look like a little point here. And then from 10 to 100, and that's how you start sort of playing with this in order for you to see what looks better for you. It's a little bit of trial and error. I don't think there is a formula to delimit, delim to delimit or to set the range. All right. That's about continuous scale. So if you have, this is like all of the ones that we have seen so far, which is, um, the scale radius or the scale area. This is for continuous variables. So this, um, whatever you have here, in this case, cylinder, uh, in this case, um, radius of planets is a continuous variable. What happens if you have a discrete variable or you want to make a continuous variable, but then you want to categorize it into levels or into a discrete variable. So that's when you use the scale size bind. So you want to have bind intervals rather than a smooth scale, right? So then this is going to be very useful, like I said, when you want to categorize size into distinct levels rather than a continuous gradient. So that is going to make the differences between your points more pronounced. So again, there is no automatic way of doing this. Like you have to say, this is how I want my data to look like. So to do that, what we do is again, you set your variable to be whichever it is that you want to showcase here in this size. You make your points and then you add the scale size spin. So look like this is how it looks like. You see now that you have this like little, even you can see here that there are like these little boxes for anything that's going to be lower than 20. This size is going to be for anything that's between 20 and 30. This is for between 30 and 40, and this is above 40. So that's exactly how they are set right now. You can obviously customize it a little bit further by using guides. So the guides are going to be the ones that are going to help you, for example, make this um, any changes that you want here. For example, the direction. If you don't want the guide, the legend to be one vertical line, you want it to be horizontal, you change that with the guides, and then you say that the direction of the guide means is going to be horizontal now. The other thing that you can do is, if you want this to show the limits, so if you want to go from 10 to 20, from 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, like those limits that you can also change and customize. But if you wanted to show the limits, then that's how you set it with um, inside the guides function. And then with within the guides, you set the size. And then with the arguments, guide bins to show the limits as true. You can, it depends, right? If you want it to look like this without the limit and it's just showing you like the, the higher value for each one of the bins, or if you want to show the lowest and the highest for each bin. And then 
I didn't know this, so I think this is super cool. If you want to add like a little arrow that is showing the increase of that um, of the and the direction of that um, of that legend, you can do that inside guide. And again, you specify that you're going to be working with size. And then you state that for the, for those guide pins that we had been working with before too, inside that argument, you're going to say that you want the access color to be red, blue, yellow, whatever you want to put in there. And then you're going to say that you want an arrow with axis arrow. The length of the arrow, you want it to be the if you want like the direction of where the point of the arrow is gonna go. So the end is gonna be first and then type is gonna be closed. So there are different like arguments here that you can customize to make the um, to make the arrow, you can have it to have two points, to have uh, like a end here to be a circle, you can customize it whatever way you want or the arrow to go in a different direction in case you have um, reversed it reverse the order so that the 40 is on top and the zero is on the bottom. So you can you can you can customize this as much as you want. Um, then let's talk about shape. So we have talked so far about size and how to customize all the different sizes of your circles. However, you don't necessarily just have to work with values you can uh, with uh, circles you can also work with other types of geoms. So in this case, for example, we have, again, with this car um, data frame, we are setting again to have this displacement to be our X axis and the mileage on the Y axis. But instead of saying size, we're specifying shape. And the shape is going to control what type of shape your geom is going to take. So we're saying that we want points, that's the geom. But the points don't necessarily have to be points. They can also be triangles. They can be squares. They can be little crosses. You can control whatever you want. A cool trip to have, and I never understood why, is if your if this variable that you're selecting to be in shape, if it's not a factor or a categorical variable, let's say it's going to be like a continuous variable, a numeric or something like that, then just by forcing it to be a factor in here is going to help so that you don't have to make any transformations uh, with that, you're just forcing it to be a factor here in case you forgot to do that before with your data set. Um, so now what you have is that each one of the values in your legend or inside your graph is gonna have a different shape. And you can also control what shape it comes in. This is what automatically ggplot does for you. You can also choose in scale the scale shape function, you can also choose to have it a solid or if you want it to be um, filled, if you want that shape to be filled or if you want it to be solid, well, solid false equals empty, right? So if you want solid true, it's going to be filled. It's going to have like this guys right here. Um, but you can also specify the, for each one of your values, so in this case, the four, which is going to be the value that you have here, this four. So if that was a word, let's say it was like low, that's the low that you have here. It depends on what um, value you have in your data frame. And then you specify the type of figure that you want it to. So this is the scale shape manual that allows you to specify the type of shape that you have specifically for each one of your values. If you don't write the four, let's say you only have values equal 16, 17, one, and two, this is going to go in the order of appearance. So then you don't have to necessarily say four or low or whatever category you have there, right? Like it's gonna, you can specify just a string of values, 16, 17, one, and two. This corresponds with, um, if I'm not mistaken, there is uh, shapes in our numbers. There is, yeah, 
So let me see if you are seeing what I'm seeing. Yes. So those, this is like, um, you can find it just by saying what shapes you have in R, just by Googling it. And then these are the values that you're going to end up with. Um, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25 can be colored, but the outline is always going to be black. Or you can change also the, the color of the outline too. But 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 usually are going to have the same color in the outside and in the inside. And then the other ones are going to be like essentially empty. So this is um, this is a way of having that. And then um, that's it for scale shape manual. Okay, let me see the chat because I see some things here. I think... Um... Kai, yes. I think Kai, mm -hmm. uh, well, Kai can fill in if I paraphrase this wrong, but I think she was looking for a quick reference for some of the shape options. There's a vignette uh, in G there's a vignette in ggplot2 that I linked, mm -hmm. but you can also do the function vignettes quotation mm -hmm. ggplot2 specs, and then it will pop it up. And then it will just give you some code that you can run it. I don't think it will actually have the picture. But it has some code yeah. in here that you run and it will output it for you. It looks like you do. It does give you the, it, it outputs the plot. Um, but that's that's not something I'm going to remember. I was hoping there'd be like a shortcut. Um, but there, I don't think there is, which is fine. Maybe. Yeah, I see. I see what you mean. So you, you want to, you want to show this like a, just a little function and say, like show, show me the numbers in parentheses and it will like plot that yeah. um which you, would be nice i could write you, that i should write that yeah you could write your phone well I'm like sure. i yeah you oh shoot am i oh, okay um what you could do is you could have your own so what i have is i have like a like my own tool set that i have as a package so like what okay. you could do and i might actually do this because this is nice is you could just do a wrapper function around that code that says show plot shapes and then just run that function for yeah, your inter for your own personal package I'm, I'm i'm doing that today so yes that's gonna be in in you can put it in your own like personal package that's what you're saying right in the calling pa package and then there's that function but if you can share the function with us in uh slack that would be amazing because i um i don't think that's gonna be too difficult to do um, and in fact, I'm pretty sure that I have seen it. If not in this book, there's maybe another book that already has it. But yeah, essentially, you want this, right? Like you want the whatever number it is associated with with each one of the um, of the shapes. So yeah, if you have that, if you create that, please share it with us in Slack, Colin, because it would be super useful. I always have to Google it. I never remember what 17 is who does, right? Anyway, the same thing with line types. So when you're dealing with lines, you can also change um, the line type that you have. This is not used so much. I feel like we color the lines more than changing the, if it's dotted or if it's, you know, a solid line. But for whatever reason, let's just see how it is. Oh, you use line types a lot? Oh, then let's go through this. Um, so essentially what you have is going to be a variable that is going to be obviously continuous one. If it's date, if it's, you know, money, if it's whatever variable it is, it just has to be continuous. And then you're going to specify it in the aesthetics of your ggplot as line type. And then obviously you do your geom line. So this is what it's going to look like automatically because you set it as line type instead of shapes, for example, or instead of um, uh, um, size, then you're going to have automatically different type of lines for each one of your values. Um, however, sometimes uh, you want to specify what type, what type is going to go with each one of your um, legends or with each one of your labels in the legend. So you can do that with, um, so these are all the different ones that you can have. They have, instead of having a number, they have like a letter M, L, K, J, J, I, all of those. 
So for that, you do scale line type manual if you want to do specifically specify for each one of your values what type you want. But if you want it to choose automatically, all you do is scale line type. Then you say what palette you want, which is going to be line types. And then you can also specify the NA value that whichever you want, which is going to be either one of these um, letters or if it's dotted, if it's dashed, if it's solid, there are different names for each one too. Um, I put them right here. Blank, solid, dash, dotted, dot, dash, long dash, or two dash. You can also put that like that. Or, like I said, F, E, D, C, whatever name there is right there. But remember that you can also use scale line type underscore manual. And then you put, again, a vector C parenthesis. And then you start putting the order that you put that. You can set it in quotes, PCE equals M or PCE equals dashed. And then that's how you're going to set each one of these, or just dashed, solid, um, what's the other one, dotted, et cetera, et cetera. So you can specify whatever. You can also change the color. So let's see how to do that by using the manual scale. So you can change the line type that you want. You can change the color. You can change anything with these manual scales. This is more how I work. Um, so let's see some examples. So for example, let's say you have, in this case, they just made, um, they're just graphing by year, this Lake Huron or Huron, I don't know how you pronounce that lake. I think it's in Michigan. And then you're setting here the level in feet of those, um, of that, of that lake based on each year. And you have two lines because you have um, the two different levels that you have. So it could be the, like the lowest. You can have the highest value here. You have essentially two categories that you want to showcase in your graph. So if we do, again, you have your aesthetics and you have that is gonna be year, and then you set the geom line, your first one that is gonna be your level, and then you are gonna add plus five because that's gonna be like your category of like your highest, and then your lowest. They're just creating this level minus five. You could have that in your data frame, right? Like set like lowest level and highest level. But in this case, in order to create that, they're just adding a five and subtracting a five. And then for each one, you're setting the color to be red and the color to be blue. So remember, this is outside the aesthetic because if it was inside the aesthetic, then it would be something different. So by putting it outside of the aesthetic, you're changing the colors. However, if you do it like this, exactly, when they are coming from base R into ggplot, this is how they do it. But the problem with doing it like this is that they won't get a legend. If you see here, you don't know which one is which. So that doesn't work here in ggplot, right? So you have to set inside the aesthetics. And you say, for example, if you want to set the label that you wanted to show in your legend, you specify it inside the aesthetics and in quotes. So let's say, you have the lowest type, highest type, whatever you wanted to have that label in your legend. That's what you put inside, put inside um, for each one of the colors, but they have to be inside the aesthetics. If it's outside, it's just going to, you can use it, right? But it's just going to change the colors. So now what this, what we did here is we created two different legends in the, two different levels in the legend. So that's great. And we, so we know exactly what each one it is, but we want to change the color because these default colors that Gplot has are horrendous. So how do we do that? So you add the scale color manual, and with that, you can change whatever title you have in your legend 
just by saying it, um, I think this is going to be name. I don't remember exactly what the argument is, but you can just start with it. And in this case, it's going to be direction. It could be height level, whatever it is that you want it to be the title of your ledger. That's what's going to appear here. And then the values. So your values, you can, again, say just red, comma, blue, because those are going to be the colors, right? You can also use hex values, or you can use the CBG, whatever it is. But I usually work with hex values, but let's say you know the names of the colors, so you can just say red and blue. But if you have, and you remember the name of the, of the value of that little label, if it's above, you can say that I want above to be red and below to be blue. And then that is what it's exactly going to show in your graph. So you're saying, so you're adding the, the manual. In this case, it's going to be the color, but you can do the same thing with shapes. You can do the same thing with, um, uh, with size and with line type. You can say, for example, here, scale, color, manual, this, and then add plus uh, scale, line type, manual and then say that you want the top one to be dashed and the bottom one to be solid so you you can change different ones manually let's say um so that it's you can customize it however and whatever whatever you want so that's more of how i work anyway and then in the last 10 minutes that we have is going to be um, let's talk about these identity scales which is the last part so these identity scales such as Scale color identity, scale shape identity, all of the functions that we have seen so far, they just end in this identity. So this is used when your data is already scaled and you have everything, uh, the data and the aesthetic spaces are the same, but you wanna change this. So let's see an example here. Um, Let's see here, the scale color identity. Let me move this right here. So this is going to use to set the scales of your data that has already been scaled. You don't want to alter any of your values. You want it to be exactly like they appear in your data frame and now just represented in your graphs space. And then, so you have um, different arguments here. So the name is going to be the name of that scale. Um, and then you're going to have the guides again that we saw before and any other aesthetics, like for example, color, fill, et cetera, that you have. So if we see here a little example, um, you can say, for example, for fill identity, You already set the fill color. You don't want anything to change. You want it to be preserved exactly like it is. And so then that's when you say scale fill identity. You can do um, scale color identity, like I said, uh, scale shape. Um, all of those can also go here. And then, oh, my ad block has been updated. And then that's it. In this example that we have here and um, that the book was given us, let me just make a quick look to see if there was anything here. Um, okay, this, um, I think this is just, so this is showing us different colors. And then you set it to scale color identity so that it preserves exactly the value that you had for each one of your points. I think that's the only thing that they were doing. Um, and then that's it. That's, that's the last part. That's how it ends. This chapter, that's, that's it. I think that's the next thing. Yeah, we have just the, um, just the, uh, um, videos. So anyway, yeah, I have never used scale identity either. I think that I customize my graphs so much where I have all the manual scales set the way I want them. So then I never use identity. And I also, 
the other thing that I don't do is um, so in this thing, let me see if I can share again my screen. Um, so the way, yeah, the way they have this set here um, with the labels, color above and color below, I never work like this. I put it in my data frame. My data frame that I am putting here has a column that says um, tight level or direction and then the labels are above below above below above below so then that's what i feed into the into the graph i usually have like my data frame set like that um so yeah but this is another way of working i don't necessarily like it because i like to have i want to make sure that my data frame whichever value i have has the correct label that makes sense. I'm a little bit um, particular about that. So I think that this is, um, if you don't know exactly how this works, um, you might, I don't know, you might, it's like um, altering your values inside ggplot. I, I'm not comfortable with that. Like I like to have all my values in my data frame exactly like I want it and then just represent them using ggplot. But it's different ways of working, right? Mm -hmm. That's it, you got. I I went ahead and I put a wrapper function into the ch not the chat but uh, in the channel. It just basically wraps, yeah. It just wraps that code from the vignette, and then you can basically you can put it where you can put it where you want. I just I have a personal package that I use for like mm -hmm. you know things like common things that I use. And so I just called it show ggplot shapes. You put it wherever you want, make sure it's installed or loaded and attached. And you can just do show ggplot shapes and it will show them. So perfect. Thank awesome. you so much, Colin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you put the link to your uh to your repository package to your uh, to the repository of your package or no i i don't know if it's local i mean there's only like a couple functions in there they're just like utility functions that i use it's just like oh okay it, it's for like my personal use so like i have like some functions in there that just do convenient things so like things that i do over and over and over again like i just have like functions that i write and i don't even think i have it do i even have version controls i don't, I don't even know if i do no, but it's just like a personal I, thing. It's not like a. Yeah, open. I always wanted to do that. It's nice because there's certain things that I do over and over again that I'm just like, I hate doing this. So then it's just like, let's just make a function yeah. and make this easier for me and my workflow. And so, but the only limit of that yes. is, is like, if I do have to pass it to somebody, then they have to have the package. But they have to install. Yeah. <laughs> I love like, that. These are, these are things like these are things like the one thing that and this is beside ggplot but like things that when you're working you're just like tired of doing like one thing is like we have internal packages that we have and so like i hate having to like do all the typing stuff for it to do it so i'm just like you know what i'm just going to create a function that just does this for me and so it's <laughs> just like install internal package package name and it does everything that i need it to do so um little things like that Yes, I think that I would like to do that at the end of this chapter. I want to do like my ggplot package, internal package, because I always use more or less the same aesthetics. I like my graphs to look a certain way. And it's and my themes are like, I already have a function for how I like my theme to be. So I think at the end of this book club, I think I'm going to, that's going to be my goal to see if I can do my internal ggplot package. Um, of how I like my graphs to look like, yeah. And I always, I also have like the same color palettes too, so that, but I have like scripts with my functions, so that's not efficient anyway. Okay, so that's it, you guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you all, um, and hopefully, hopefully Ashley too next week with uh, Kaya and Chapter Thirteen. Right. Thank Fabulous. you so much, you guys. Have Thank a you, Gabby. have a lovely week. Yay. Hi. Okay. Oh, stop, stop, stop. <laughs>